uh, what uh, what I want to do today is, is uh, uh, the finish up our discussion on 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 uh, uh, strain induced effects, uh, specifically on on dislocations and defects. I think I'm a bit ahead here, uh, and uh, just recap a little bit of what we did in the last class, and then uh, uh, look at. Uh, uh, a few more uh, uh, details of dislocations and specifically I'll give you quite a few examples. Uh, some of it I just uh, thought would be uh, useful for you to see. I mean, for example, in our own research, uh, I'll show you some of the latest stuff we are trying to do and how we are encountering dislocations and what are its effects on uh, uh, compound semiconductor devices. I also want to share a little bit of that today. Uh, and uh, uh, I'd I'd initially planned not to talk too much about, uh, uh, just mention it in passing, the, the, the effect of uh, uh, dislocations in, and defects in uh, lower dimensions. And we have talked primarily about 3D till now. But I just briefly mentioned 2D, and I initially was thinking I was not going to talk about it, but I will a little bit today on, on defects in 2D, because uh, uh, actually there's a very deep connection between uh, uh, between uh, what are defects and dislocations in a crystal and what are charges or uh, photons or something in a field you know uh, so it's actually the same thing you know the mathematically they're identical uh, uh, you know it's a uh, um, broken symmetry in a crystal is a dislocation or a point defect and such things and broken symmetry is in a e either a classical field or even a quantum mechanical field are charges and you know skirmions and vortices and that sort of thing that uh, that you see. I mean, so it's the same thing in in some sense. So there, as a result, there's been also a lot of deep connection between people who are trying to figure out what dislocations are and how they move and and and, and things like that. And then they realize that uh, it's actually very similar to how charges move in electromagnetic field and things like that. So so there's a very strong connection. I just want to point that out. Yeah. Okay, so uh, to recap what we did in the last class was uh, essentially uh, uh, ask uh, the question that, uh, uh, in a very simple question, that if I am trying to grow a, a compound semiconductor layer on top of another uh, epitaxially, and, uh, oh, that's a bit bad. okay, that's fine, uh, 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 with, a, with a larger lattice constant, uh, and, and then let's say this one is a smaller lattice constant, but it's much thicker, it's a substrate, right? And, and, uh, uh, what we uh, so we're asking uh, uh, the questions that we're asking is if I want to grow a thickness h here, right? Then it's pretty clear I have to provide some energy to squeeze it and keep it strained, right, and coherent. And that high we derived after uh, somewhat heuristic uh, expression, uh, you know, uh, uh, heuristic, but at the same time well calibrated uh, um, uh, physics uh, uh, that that the coherent energy would be proportional. To strain squared times some you know half kx squared sort of picture right uh, so there, there there were these coefficients uh, 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 which were related to the spring constants the Poisson uh, the Poisson ratio of the crystal uh, and then h is the thickness as you increase it uh, the strain energy uh, uh, cost grows linearly with the thickness and then uh, there's a strain squared or a misfit strain squared right so so that, that's what we said and uh, if it was completely coherently strained then uh, it would take up the lattice constant of the substrate. Uh, but then we, if we say that, let's say I'm going to allow for a certain array of dislocations to form and relax the strain, right? And then that's how we got uh, uh, that uh, the, the expression for that was, uh, you know, 1 minus mu and all that. And then the thickness times the misfit strain minus uh, certain uh, misfit dislocation density times the Berger vector squared. It's the net strain squared, right? And then the dislocation uh, cost, on the other hand, right? Uh, uh, the dislocation cost uh, was uh, uh, essentially, you have a, if I form a dislocation here, uh, we saw in pictures at least uh, that the strain field around the dislocation goes down as 1 over r as you go away from the dislocation. And sometimes, I mean, depending upon the, for example, in an edge dislocation, you have this strain field that switches sign because, you know, one side of it is compressively strained, the other side is tensile and all that. So you get a sine theta or R sort of dependence here, right? So, so, uh, 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 so based on that, and you can kind of look at the net strain energy stored in the field around the dislocation, and, and we get, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the 
it depends on the number of dislocation. Each dislocation brings you, uh, you know, costs you a certain energy. Then you add it all up for a linear dimension, you know, along the say x direction, and then. Uh, uh, that, that, that that's the expression we get, and uh, the total energy was the sum of, of of these two. So let me just write that down. It's mu b squared over four pi, uh, and and uh, uh, I think you already see the appearance of you know things that look like electrostatic charge and potentials, right? But uh, 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 and uh, there were angles. Let me just go through this, uh, and and then we got a. Uh, natural log of if the thickness is h remember we had to have a high end cutoff right the ultraviolet cutoff was h because the finite thickness of the layer right and the infrared cutoff the lower end of the cutoff was b over 4 and we gave reasons for it right and then so that that's the full expression right? the natural, it's, a, it's a logarithmic divergence on both sides and uh, uh, right 1 over r integral right? so so that's we had talked about that here yeah. Uh, and, and now uh, the total co total energy cost of having this layer was the sum uh, of, of, of the coherence energy plus the dislocation energy. And what we uh, showed, was, well, uh, looking at this as a function of the density of dislocations, right, the density of dislocations, uh, this is the coherence energy. And uh, the dislocation energy is linear with the density of dislocations as a row MD stating here, whereas that's parabolic. So that just goes like that, and the sum of that will have a minima either at zero or offset, right? Either at zero or at offset. And what has changed between these two plots is the thickness h. That's all that has changed, right? So here it's increasing as you increase h. This thing is increasing linearly, but the dislocation cost is increasing only logarithmically, right? So as a result, this curvature becomes higher as you you know, it, it goes faster, and I, I think you can see that the slope here of the cur of the curved line will win out, and then you will it will curve it further down, and then the minima will shift here. Right? right? Is that clear? So, so it's just geometrically inevitable that uh, there's a certain thickness beyond which this is going to happen. Right? right? Uh, and then that that thickness is the critical thickness beyond which you're going to generate dislocations. And you can write this whole expression down, take a derivative, find its minima. For a range of values, the minima will be at zero, and then beyond a certain h, the minima will be positive, right? And then that gives you both the critical strain for if you have a fixed thickness. If you fix this, I, I only need four nanometers, but I need a very small band gap layer, you know? but I only have four, need four nanometers. So, right? How small can I go? Well, that means that your thickness is fixed. But now you're saying, how much strain can I put in? How, how far off can I go in lattice constant? And that's the misfit. This is the equation. You know, right? And basically, it's one equation. It's just you know, figure out. And the other end is, if I fix the strain, f is the misfit strain, how, how thick can I grow? And then you solve that. It's the same equation. You just have two variables in there, depending upon what you fix and what you uh, let, let uh, vary. right? And, and this is uh, really the celebrated or very well-known uh, Matthews Blakesley law or, or thickness uh, uh, expression. Probably you've seen that earlier. Uh, and, and it's a transcendental equation. You've got to solve it. You know, there's HC and HC here, so you've got to uh, self-consistently solve. It. And once you solve it, uh, here's an example for silicon germanium. Uh, and uh, as you vary the germanium content, so what do I mean by silicon germanium? This layer is silicon germanium. This is silicon, right? So that has larger lattice constant and smaller band gap, right? You're growing it on top of silicon, and now uh, uh, how thick can you grow? Basically, as you increase the germanium content, as you realize the misfit is going up, F is increasing. F is delta A over A. That's the misfit uh, value. It's going up, and then uh, that's the. If you plug in this formula, see the nice thing with the formula is there's very little unknowns here. I mean, so Poisson ratio very well known, you know. Uh, uh, the bogus vector is basically a lattice constant, right, and, and all that. So there's really nothing much left here. Beta is the angle between, that's very well known, uh, between the dislocation and the plane. So, uh, right. Uh, uh, okay, so the, uh, uh, so the, this is what you get. And then, uh, so there's a phase transition basically structurally, therefore, below, uh, if you're, the thickness stays, by, you know, the, the thickness of the silicon germanium stays below, 
this value for that particular strain, you're coherent. If not, you're dislocated and you know relaxed. So the strain, strain, the relaxation. Uh, and uh, so these are experimental data points. In fact, a lot of this work uh, uh, is now uh, really um, making a huge impact in these HBTs, silicon germanium HBTs. Uh, you know, this is the initial work to figure out what are the ranges of values you can use, how much you know, silic how much germanium can I put in? And uh, I think you realize that silicon band gap is something like that, and germanium band gap is smaller. More germanium you can put in, the more band offsets you can get here, and that sort of thing, right? So, and more is the band offset you can get, typically a better the transistor becomes. So, so, so it's a better a bipolar transistor, a heterostructure bipolar transistor becomes. And so, so you know, it, that, that, that uh, a lot of the work was done in. Uh, 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 I would say very late 80s and then 1990s and some in 2000s as well and finally uh, late 2000s is when uh, some of these silicon germanium HBTs started becoming commercialized so and now they're starting to, I mean they're actually in, in, in the market now so uh, and, and a lot of this initial silicon germanium work was also done uh, uh, for example uh, one of the very uh, well-known people in this area is uh, Gene Fitzgerald who was a PhD student here in, in Bard Hall in material science and is now a professor at MIT, I had a couple of companies trying to commercialize this as well. So, so your job is cut out, you know. So. <laughs> okay. So uh, and then they they you know studied this and dislocation relaxation, how you know temp effect of temperatures and how do you remove use dislocations or avoid them and such things. And so, yeah, okay. so uh, so now, um, okay, ho hopefully this is uh, uh, clear, and, and uh, th so these are basically the critical values, but then if I, if I kind of say that, well, uh, tell me how much strain do I have, if I don't care about the critical values, I just go and go ahead and grow, uh, uh, say my misfit is 1%, you know, 0 0.01 strain, and then I'm going to grow, you know, 20 nanometer, uh, 20 angstroms, then there's no strain, no dislocation. Uh, sorry, there's strain, it's coherent, no dislocations. And then you hit the critical thickness of about 100 or 10 nanometers, and then you s start generating dislocations. But if you grow only 200 nanometer, uh, two, 20 nanometers, 200, 200 angstroms, you are not completely free yet. So it's partially relaxed. Okay? Then you asymptotically approach full relaxation and, and, and such. Okay? Uh, now, uh, and then similarly, I mean, basically, uh, uh, what you're doing here is now you're writing the sum. We had found the minima, right? Uh, as a function of the dislocation uh, network and all that. The minima you can find, but then uh, you can always calculate what's the total energy, you know, plug back in uh, the minima value and calculate around it. And, and then when you calculate, this is the plot for that. But the expression is the same. Okay, so I'll say a couple of things about, uh, the, so this is all uh, about dislocations on the top layer, right? Just the, just one layer. But now obviously we know that Many situations, I want to go back to another unstrained layer on top. So this will be a buried quantum well, like a silicon germanium quantum well, indium gallium arsenide quantum well, or indium gallium nitride quantum well for visible LEDs. Right? So then uh, uh, the dislocation can do uh, kind of, there are various things it can do. Uh, I'm starting to, uh, I'm going to kind of not go into the details of this now, but once you understand the very basic idea, I think everything just is, slight modification of this, so I'm not going into all the details, but I posted a relatively long handout this time for these chapters because I think it's well written, so, uh, and, and I'm, this is from Sau's book, Jeff Sau's book, okay, uh, so uh, please read that out, but essentially what it's saying is if you have, for example, uh, a, a top layer, you know, just one AP layer on top of a substrate, then what can happen is you have, a, let's say, a dislocation that's not going perpendicularly, but it's going at an angle, all right, and then uh, it could either continue in this layer like that. So let's say you had a dislocation here to start with, even you know from the substrate. Then, uh, uh, for example, it could continue, or it could, you know, bend over, uh, you know, or kink, uh, and then continue again like that. Right? So that, uh, and it turns out if you do the energetics of this for certain conditions of, uh, uh, of, 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 of uh, you know, the scales that we talked about of, of. Uh, say the mu's and the Poisson ratios, this is more preferable to bend, or sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just stuck like that. Right? Uh, if you have a buried layer, on the other hand, this is a, also very interesting what you can, so this is called a single kink, you know, so you have just one kink here. Uh, in a buried layer, uh, uh, you can have a double kink, you can go, and this location can be here. And, and it's a double, so there's one kink here and another kink there. Right? And then when you heat the material, for example, these things can actually move. 
you know, the kings can move and it, it will glide or move and it can move and uh, 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 you can um, sometimes if you're lucky in some some structures uh, you can actually remove that dislocation so, so you can make it go up so uh, sometimes so so you can uh, glide the dislocation so there are many processes now of dislocation movement uh, 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 so nucleation and movement and then you can glide it, it can get stuck around some other defects around point defects something it gets a loop forms a loop and gets stuck uh, just like a in an electron trying to move around a positive charge but it can get stuck in its potential and bound in the same similar way yeah? um, and and, uh, and and anyway dislocations can multiply and, and such so uh, uh, so uh, so buried layers, for example, uh, here, here's an example of a silicon germanium buried layer of a certain sil sil germanium composition. And you see this strain field is zero in the silicon underneath, zero in the silicon buffer, but it's, you know, uh, two, of, two of the Seagate layers has, has the strain in it. Right? And typically the such structures are used for, I mean, this is a resonant tunneling diode structure where you have double barrier. Oh, sorry, there, this is a double quantum well structure single barrier and such things. So you, you can do all kinds of interesting experiments in it. What is shown here is, is, is the, uh, uh, for example, the, uh, uh, the, 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 stre uh, the stress uh, cost, you know, sigmas are the stress and e it should be epsilon here, the strain. But for the competition here between forming, uh, uh, so, so for example, single kink versus double kink energies and all that is the competition between the two and you can kind of, just like we did for normal, uh, 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 single layer structures, you can do it for double layers and double heterostructures and all that kind of stuff. Is it? Okay, so I'm uh, not getting into all the details there, but what I'll mention is, uh, for example, if you are d just having a top layer uh, of strain, uh, strain layer, another process of strain relaxation or, you know, not trying to pay the cost of forming defects and, and linear defects like dislocations is the surface can become like this. So this is corrugation, the surface can modulate itself. And this way, uh, also, you can. Uh, uh, this is one possibility, possible way to to not form defects and still re remain coherent, even with lattice mismatch. This is basically like a rug, right? I mean, you are, when you press a rug, you see it does that, right? For example, so it's not, not uh, uh, that. Uh, no, and, and this sort of thing. Uh, is much more common, will be much more common in 2D systems, in a, in a, in a way where there's no chemical bonding in the vertical direction. So if you stretch or strain a 2D layer, you know, stretch this way, can form stripes and you know, uh, corrugations and all that. Right? Uh, so, uh, and then this is from actually a, a, a end of the chapter problem from the South chapter that I posted. So you can have a look at that. Um, what I want to do uh, uh, just is, is to outline a couple of things I had mentioned about the defects now, and, and then uh, go over to its effects on, or the consequences of these defects on electronic properties, on, 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 on optical properties, and of devices and such. So, so we first, I want to point out two things that I wanted to kind of skip, but I think it's probably a good idea to just mention it. So uh, one of the things you noticed is this: the potential of, of these defects go as uh, uh, you know the the uh, go uh, look very very similar uh, if you forget about all these constants in the front at least it looks very similar to that of a charged line right i'd mentioned that a charged line has an electrostatic potential that goes as natural log of r right away from the center of the of this charge uh, of the line and uh, uh, so, uh, if I look at, uh, for example, the 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 the, the edge dislocation, uh, uh, so, so, so there's uh, you know uh, there's there's a, a comp there's a tensile strain here, there's a compressive strain here, and then it changes direction and all that. But essentially, you can write down now the displacement or the st the the displacement of the atom from its, let's say, the perfect crystal position, at any r, okay. And uh, uh, if you actually take that, the displacement of the atom, or, or you, you can relate it directly to the strain. The displacement divided by the original lattice constant is, 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 is kind of the strain, right? So d delta x over x. And uh, what you'll notice is if you take that and you take uh, del squared, of the, just the displacement, uh, 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 or, or rather, okay, you know what? Let me, let me step back. Let me correct myself. Let's take... Let's not take the displacement. Let's take the potential. Okay, so the, here's the potential energy of uh, an edge dislocation. Right? So if I take that potential energy, so let me get a view, big U of an edge dislocation. 
what you'll find is actually it is equal to zero. Del squared of it, no, no, square. And uh, I'm kind of, you can say it in many ways. I'm saying it one way, which is, I'm saying that it's, it's, you know, it's surprising it's zero, but it's actually not because you could have thought of it as a potential, the, as a Laplacian potential in the first place. But anyway, so this is what you're going to get. The, 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 the uh, uh, del squared of that epsilon would be equal to zero for edge dislocation and all that. So, uh, and then uh, if you want to now look at, I'm going to specifically talk uh, about, say, the edge dislocation for now. Right? And, and uh, I think what you also know that if I have edge dislocation, let's say I have a plane like that, and uh, I'm going to. Um, okay, so uh, so if that's the potential, uh, you you can uh, you know this is this is the Laplacian problem in electrostatics, okay, uh, uh, meaning or in many fields, not just, right? So this is the Laplacian in electrostatics, for example, this could be the electrostatic potential. But here is the strain-related potential. So, uh, so from here, you can come up with, there are many potentials that will lead that. And obviously, the right potential is the one that matches the right boundary conditions, right? I mean, that's how you solve the problem. Here, in addition to boundary, boundary condition, there's another very nice wrinkle to the problem, which says that, for example, let's say, let's say for a screw dislocation. If I start here, you know, let's say that's my x, and that's my y, and that's say my z direction. Uh, if I uh, start here, and I uh, essentially go around, right? And if I have a screw dislocation, I don't come back to where I was, right? So I come back to one unit cell above, right? That's and, and then it's, it's, it's actually a spiral now, right? Uh, uh, that that would be a, a screw dislocation where the Burgers vector is that way and the you know, line is this way, right? The Burgers vector is parallel to the line. Right? So we had, you know, that picture is maybe not as illustrative as maybe this one, where, right? So this is like a circular parking lot, right? Where you go on the top, if you go around once, you, you gain one floor, right? So, so uh, for that, uh, what you can do is uh, uh, one can, I mean, any potential that solves the problem, uh, you know, works out for you and matches boundary condition is fine. But you can write it as, a, uh, and then this is kind of a nice uh, way to write it, is as you can write it as a function which has this property that if you rotate it by pi, uh, by, 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 by 2 pi, then you gain some, you know, uh, some factor, right? It doesn't come back to itself. You know? so, 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 and, and, and then uh, uh, this is one example. You can write it like that, x plus i, y so as the potential natural log of x plus iy, right? And uh, I think you know that x plus iy is basically r e to the power i theta, right? Uh, same thing. But, but you have to be a little careful when you take the natural log, because natural log is always, you know, there's a 2 pi, you know, modulo to it, right? So natural log uh, as a modulo of 2 pi. And what I'm trying to say is if you, if you kind of write my potential as, you know, it's a Burgers vector times the, you know, your, your uh, compliance coefficients and all that over 2 pi times this thing, but you know, kind of make it, the, all right, I'm going to write it this way. You can make it the imaginary part of that. Then what you'll see is as you turn theta by 2 pi, uh, uh, the, uh, well, so you will end up here. First of all, you won't come back to where you were. You were off by 2 pi and all that. And from here, th this will be a potential that will satisfy your this thing, and it'll also satisfy the fact that it's a dislocation. So there is a, uh, in a non-periodicity, or there's a rotation. You gain something in a rotation, and then from here, uh, when you take the, uh, uh, you know, that's your potential. So if you want to find, uh, you know, the strain field around it, uh, you can take the gradients and all that, and and then uh, that's where you know if you get, you will get. You know the absolute value of the r is that, and uh, the x is that here, plus i times y over. You, you, you can you know, essentially, when you start taking derivatives and get getting strains and all that, you are going to get the factors that we had come up with in the end that look like you know sine theta over r. Remember, so we can get it from here directly. So, so that's one way to get it. It's just a mathematical way to get it, but the mathematical. Uh, Correspondence between these two goes a lot further. For example, if I had another uh, dislocation out here, not too far from here, which instead of having this sort of rotation, remember here the rotation sense is this way, meaning as you go this way, you're going up, right? But you can have another screw dislocation here, which has a rotation sense that way, where if you start rotating, you're coming back downwards here, right? So, 
spirally down. Right? Similarly, you can have edge. So this is just a screw. And when you have such two dislocations like that, and let's say you have built up your whole nice you know, natural log picture for one, then you can start doing uh, you know, x plus i, y plus natural log of x plus i, y plus, oh, you know, y minus y naught, where there's a y displacement for this one. Why not? Do, do you know what I mean? You can treat them as point charges now and add their potentials and all that stuff now. So, and then you will get the net strain field and all that sort of thing. Right? So, uh, and you'll get, if I am somewhere here and I'm doing a loop, you'll see that you will not come back. I mean, you'll come back to where you are. Right? Right? If I'm sitting here outside the core, uh, you know, uh, lines, but only if my line, for example, on the other hand, if I go around like that, I'll still come back to where I was. Right? But if I go like that, I won't. Right? I'll go back one up. If I go like that, I'll go one down, right? and so on. So, so there's this mixture of, of uh, not. I mean, it's a winding number in some sense. Or it's, it's not the winding number. It's basically the that's also changing, and uh, uh, such a function always takes care of, of of these topological properties of this of these defects. So, okay. so very interesting uh, consequence, and then. Uh, uh, Okay, so so it, it uh, you know it, uh, the, some of these realizations uh, also came from classical physics as well as quantum field theory and all that, and it has this picture has a lot of analogies to many, many other fields, is what I'm saying. So, okay, I won't say too much more than that, and you can, uh, if you are interested, you can follow up. I can suggest some papers, and all that. that's all. Uh, the second thing I want to say is the question of dislocations. Oh, uh, I don't know. I mean, probably it was somewhat vague, but hopefully this, this, the notion is clear. Is you know, uh, you, you can uh, there are some mathematical functions that can represent it, but at, at the same time you can visually also see that there are uh, uh, ways for you to be able to uh, you know, just like the, the Gauss-Bonnet theorems and all. If you if you come back to where you are, you know you are not you know the loop you have gone around has no dislocation. That much you know. Right? Not, not quite, right? It can have one positive and one negative, right? and then so on. So, so you, you can only say things modulo something, right? and, and, and things like that. So, yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, one of the, uh, so the second thing I wanted to say was what happens when instead of three D you go to two D or one D, right? And uh, I, what I'll point out is, uh, uh, or rather, what I'll describe now is just one of the uh, interesting. Uh, well, I had already mentioned to you, and you are so, uh, kind of addressing that in your current assignment problem. But uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, 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 dislocation or defects in two dimensions. Let's say, okay? not in three D, but in two D. And and uh, uh, the the question really I'm after, uh, or we, I want to ask is: uh, Is there? Can I have? Uh, so let's say I have a 2D, 2D crystal, graphene or nitride, molysulfide. Molysulfide is quasi 2D because it's three atom nuclear. Actually, everything is quasi 2D because uh, quasi 3D because the atom also has certain length scale and such things. But the center of the atoms can really be in one plane, a perfectly two-dimensional plane. Perfectly two-dimensional plane can be also questioned if you think about gravitation and curvature of space-time and all that. But you know, let's not worry about all that stuff right now. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah. So you'd be surprised that actually, not maybe not surprised, but if you have taken any courses on gravitational relativity, the strain physics of elasticity is pretty much the same theory as as the uh, relativity, you know, gravitation theory. You know, the strain coefficients are the they are called strain tensors here, and they are called some other tensors there, right? And the uh, you have the uh, your compliance coefficient matrix, the C's, you know, is 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 your uh, uh, I don't know the Euclidean tensor, you know, G, uh, G's and all that. It's the same thing, really, uh, just in a slightly modified form. And the fact you are getting all these one over Rs and and other one over r squares is not a big surprise. It's all the same, you know, identical, really. The theories are not that different. So let's see. So if the, the question we're asking now is, uh, uh, you know, in general, uh, can I have? Uh, this is a very weird question. That can you have a two D crystal at all, right? And then that's obviously kind of been 
uh, argued a lot uh, and uh, earlier, but now people are making it, right? I mean, people are imaging these 2D crystals and such. So, uh, and, and, and uh, this is related to uh, one of the problems you have in the, in the current assignment, but what I want to show is uh, there is, uh, uh, you can actually uh, calculate the energy cost of uh, fluctuations here, uh, of, 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 of fluctuations. Uh, just like we did for energy cost of, of dislocations. You know? So when I say fluctuations, what, what we mean is if I have atoms here or lattice points here and a basis atoms attached to each one of them, then you know, there's a perfect crystal structure and then there are potentially some changes of fluctuations in them, right? And uh, the question really is once you have fluctuations, is the energy higher than if it was perfect or is it lower? Right? That's always the question, right? If the fluctuations lead to a lower energy, then obviously this thing is not stable, right? The perfect crystal is not stable. That's the idea, really, right? If you take a solid, you know, so aluminum, and you heat it to 700 C, right? you know it's not going to remain a solid. Its melting point is 660 C. But what's the reason? Because the fluctuations went up. The energy cost of being a liquid and losing the long-range order of a crystal you know, it may, basically the energy uh, of, of, of having that entropic, I mean, the uh, liquid form is, is, is lower, so it goes through that state, right? It cannot, so, so exactly in the same way, it's kind of a melting of a 3D crystal. The question you can ask is, uh, so, so what was proved, um, uh, what was proven um, initially by Rudy Piles, you know, it's, it's, uh, <coughs> I can never s spell his name, Piles, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and then by Lev Landau, uh, uh, the, what they proved was uh, the long-range order or long-range crystallinity, right, is only stable in three dimensions. It, or rather, three dimensions is the minimum number of dimensions where long-range order is stable to fluctuations. The moment you turn on any fluctuations, 3D remains stable, but 2D becomes unstable, 1D becomes unstable. That's what they showed. When, uh, what sort of fluctuations? You can have many kinds, but what they showed was it's for temperatures. You know, if T is not equal to zero, even the slightest temperature change is going to destroy long range order. That's what they showed. This is, uh, and and uh, 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 it has been uh, since then. It was worked out uh, quite a bit actually here at Cornell actually by Merman and Wagner, right? I think probably you might have heard this. Uh, and now it goes under the name of this Merman-Wagner theorem. And the theorem really says something which, again, seems weird that a 2D crystal cannot exist, you know, or, or, you know, so, and, and, uh, but what, to be very accurate, what it really says is, is something you can actually figure, uh, once we write down, you'll realize an infinitely large 2D crystal cannot exist. So that's really what it says. If it's finite, it's going to still be stable. There'll be ultraviolet cutoff and all that, in, and the length scale will be fixed. Just like the dislocation energy didn't blow up because it had a finite thickness. Same way it's going to be, become stable, right? And the idea is really not very difficult to uh, uh, prove, and it uh, uh, and the reason I'm doing uh, talking about this problem right now is is because this problem appears again and again in many forms, because the mathematics of it is very interesting, right? and uh, it appears in superconductivity, it appears in uh, all kinds of uh, phase transitions, uh, uh, and, and that sort of thing. So, and then it's actually a not very difficult mathematics either. So what it's saying is, look. I'm going to say that uh, what is the energy cost of fluctuations, right? Well, energy cost is always half kx squared, right? That's what we have already seen. And uh, let's say I have, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I'll have basically two vectors here, or, or I have a vector that represents the displacement and the, uh, the, co the energy cost of, of, let's say, the alpha now atom here is, is uh, uh, half times some C alpha, let's say. Uh, times u alpha squared, uh, sorry, uh, what did I do here? Uh, let's, uh, yeah, let's call it, yeah, let me call it, uh, u is the displacement, I think I'm always conf confused with the energy, let's call it r, right, r alpha is the displacement. It's not his equilibrium position, but it's displacement from the exact periodic position. I'm going to outline it very, you know, cr roughly, I'm not, not going to all the details. So, uh, now, uh, the total, uh, the total here would be uh, essentially, um, uh, so you, let's write it big way. So it's the energy cost of each atom 
being displaced. There's a certain spring constant of the crystal and all that stuff, right? Uh, and then uh, what you can do now is, is say that what is the, uh, uh, if I sum up all the displacements of the whole crystal, right? It's an infinite crystal, let's say 2D. Uh, well, you can sum, get a big U, is a sum of all small U's. Right? Uh, all U alphas here. And that's basically uh, a sum of R alpha squared over all alphas, right? And uh, uh, now what you do is uh, uh, you can go and convert this. <clears throat> uh, so you're summing, and I think you, we know that if you have a large a lattice, a very large crystal, then the lattice spacing is very small. You can convert that thing into an integral, right? When you convert into an integral, another very nice thing you can do is, is to mint, you know, look at long-range order. So what we are uh, trying to find is, is there long-range order or long-range crystalline order? Uh, meaning if I know the atom here and I go, you know, one or uh, ten centimeters away, can I still be related by a lattice vector? That's really long-range order. Right? The whole silicon wafer, if I know an atom there, I know that there's another atom there. You know, maybe five centimeters away, I can locate another atom precisely, right? It's a perfect crystal. So, so uh, you, can, uh, you can basically decompose these R alphas. The way this is, uh, the way you go about is, is you write these R alphas as, you know, some coefficient e to the power. Uh, you, you go into the Fourier domain is what you have to do here, you know, so. so. Uh, something like that for each uh, remember there's no confusion this is the displacement of the art uh, uh, of the alpha number atom and here this is a vector now you can just choose some origin it's r and this can de decompose it that way right. you can decompose any 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 uh, 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 so, so each point here has some R alpha, that alpha, so you can decompose it. Uh, and, and then once you plug it back in here, what you end up getting is really that uh, 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 C alphas, and then you get, uh, I'm, I'm going to basically start making some very crude approximations here, but what you get from here is E to the power I K alpha dot R, something like that, right? Yeah, I'm going to just write it like that. Write like that, and then uh, uh, to find the total energy, you're going to sum it over all alphas, and uh, the sum goes into an integral. And you, 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 instead of summing over real space alphas, now you can sum it over k's, k alphas. Okay, and uh, uh, let me just. Uh, uh, okay. So we're going to first things first. We write it properly, d2r. That's the real energy. You're summing it over all real spaces, okay? And uh, um, <clears throat> all right. So I think I, I I think I did a little bit of error. So the strain energy, right? So I, I forgot. So the strain energy is the difference between, you know, if both of them move the same dis direction, there's no strain. I mean, the whole crystal translates, right? So the strain energy really depends on the derivative of our alpha, you know, the delta x over x, right? So it really pulls this thing down. I'm, as you can see, I'm really crudely doing this. So I should really write uh, the total strain energy should have uh, running out of uh, yeah, d alpha over dr, something like that. Does that make sense? Is this the derivative of that? position okay uh, or, or you know so, so, uh, hopefully all that will do is, is pull out this i k in the front that's, that's all it's going to do uh, uh, and and uh, 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 and then when you actually uh, so there'll be k squared here after uh, uh, so let me just uh, write this big thing down uh, how it's going to go right and just uh, uh, try to argue what I'm trying to get, get to right now so there are all these coefficients and all that and, and then essentially you're going to get a k squared and then your, uh, uh, you know, the the ma max amplitude uh, R alpha all squared, something like that. You're going to end up getting. And this R alpha squared, which is the how far is it vibrating? And if you if you're vibrating it using temperature, 
uh, that's related to KT. Right? Even even classically, there's no quantum mechanics involved at, at this point. You can take it all quantum mechanical, but uh, what you can basically show is is the uh, uh, R square, and this is what you're doing also in your assignment actually, is is going to be like Kate Boltzmann constant T over you know this wave vector. We have, we wrote it as K. Uh, uh, you know, let, sorry, sorry about all this uh, mess here. I didn't quite plan to say that, but we could write this as Q in, just to avoid confusion with Boltzmann constant Q dot R. So it pulls out a Q square and all that. So it, it will look like uh, uh, there'll be your compliance coefficient and and the volume uh, and and the volume and all that. So it's going to look something like this, and there'll be Q squared. All they're saying is there's a one over Q square variation with temperature of the vibra average lattice vibration, the distance of the vibration, the amplitude, goes as temperature over some other constant temperature. I mean, this, uh, and then there's a Q squared. Long range Qs uh, behave like that. So this is also, if you take a Fourier transform in three dimensions of one over R, you will, you will, you will, you will uh, end up getting something like this as well. So, so you get that. And now, if you want to find the total energy, you, you, you go from real space and you can convert into d squared k to k space, it's constants and all that. And what you end up, again, getting, this is q, q, this is q squared. And uh, <laughs> the upshot of all this is you're going to get this integral. That, that, that's what you end up going to get in two dimensions. In d dimensions, you d to the power d d dimension, three dimensions, one dimensions, you're always going to get something like this. They'll, the upshot of it is because of thermal vibrations, your long range vibration, or rather the vibration order as you go to, you know, in wavelength, longer and longer wavelength, it goes as one over Q squared. That's kind of the main, one of the main results here. Again, uh, there's a statistical average uh, in the thermodynamic average. So your total energy is going to look something like this, right? one over Q squared integral and there'll be stuff in the front, you know, C and all this other stuff in the front. And the argument now is, is a, this is an interesting integral because uh, 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 you can take D to be, let's say three, three dimensions, right? and say what will the integral be? Well, three dimensions is like four pi k squared dk, right? right? Oh, sorry, again, messing up with the constants here, four pi q squared dk, over all these other constants, but you can see now you are, what you are integrating is q squared q squared cancel, right? And you are integrating dq, right? So it's a linear integral, right? Linear integral. Now q's for small values you can take to zero. What does q zero mean? It means my fluctuations are very long wavelength. That's q is equal to zero. It's very long wavelength fluctuations. So I can have this atom not move. This atom moves a little bit. That moves. And then as I go, so it's very long. It could be centimeters. Right? So there is really not much of a limit of, you can have very long wavelength. There's a, some sort of a limit with the, uh, uh, the, the maximum length of the solid. Right? That places a certain limit on this. This is the infrared. Uh, but if you have a very infinitely large solid, this is zero. You can have very long wavelength. But the top one is you can't fluctuate more than a lattice constant. That's the ultraviolet range, so, right? Because once you, is that clear? I mean, because then you have clearly no solid left. So there you can put the Q will be one over a lattice constant A naught. Right? And then you see this is finite. This is well behaved. Right? There's no divergence in this energy. Right? Is that clear? It's a linear integral. You go from one by A naught to A naught. All fine, right? No, no problem with this. But the moment you go to two dimensions, what you now note is if D is equal to two, your volume element in k space is not 4 pi k square to k, but it's 2 pi k times uh, 2 pi q times dq, right? Note that right away. Right? And now you see you are integrating. You know, forget 2 pi. You are integrating 1 over q, and that's natural log, right? Natural log of q. And uh, now you can see why there's a big problem here, right? With an infinitely long solid because you're going to go 0 to 1 over a naught, but you have a logarithmic divergence. It diverges. It's the energy cost is too high. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. And 1D is even more severe. Right? You go to 1D, 
So there was 2 pi dq and 1 d becomes just dq by q squared. So it becomes 1 over q, not natural. So you have really an even stronger divergence now. Right? right? So this is a, a very standard uh, method to show, or it's a very interesting dimensionality argument that uh, uh, is used to, pro to, to, to suggest that an infinitely large 2D crystal cannot be stable to vibrations. It will uh, basically form corrugations and all that. But finite length is not a problem because your lower length, lower end of the spectrum, for 2D at least, natural log of Q, for 2D, uh, 1 over A naught. For finite length, you can put 1 over the length of the crystal, H, and then that's fine. So it's, it can be stable, right? So, so that's uh, one of the ideas. Okay. So this, this particular, uh, you know, in the end, it boils down to the mathematical uh, form like this, and this was realized uh, in, in, in late, uh, and mid, middle of last century, and 50s and 60s. And so Marmin Wagner theorem is one form of it. You know? So, so it's, it's one form over the uh, to the crystals, and uh, it's got a lot to do with spin, uh, icing models, and fermionic systems, and in, in, in condensed matter physics, and uh, uh, and so on. I mean, that's, that's okay. So I'll just stop here. I think this is a was a bit bit of a detour for me, but I think it's a very interesting, very interesting thing about low dimensions and and and, and the effect of dimensionality on stability. You know, so it's kind of an interesting thing. You know. Okay. So uh, uh, what I want to do. Uh, 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 next is is uh, talk a bit more about uh, 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 going back to dislocations and a little more uh, non esoteric things. Uh, so uh, uh, what we'll talk about now is is uh, go to and, and ask uh, that if I have dislocations, uh, uh, actually yeah. Before I say uh, talk about uh, electronic and photonic properties, let me just say two things. Uh, one is if I really want a strain layer. But I, I or rather, if I w really want a layer which ha which uh, is is mismatched with the substrate, but uh, 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 you know I'm forced to live with dislocations, right? What can I do to protect and, and make 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 uh, devices with it? For example, what I mean is if I if I have a substrate, and and let's say I, I have to grow a layer which I know is below above the critical thickness, I I can't you know I, I need it above the critical thickness for a certain device application, right? But all the device stuff happens somewhere here, right? And not here, right? So you can see that if you figure out a way to to limit your dislocations to to this window, you can be okay. You know this layer can be completely free of dislocation. Right? That's possible. Right? And then such a layer would be called a uh, would be called a metamorphic layer. That's the name at least used. Uh, as opposed to something that's completely coherently strained would be called a pseudomorphic layer. Pseudomorphic is when it's completely coherently strained and you're below the critical thickness. So pseudomorphic. And and these are uh, names that are uh, actually, if you read uh, papers or articles, you will see sometimes it will be called p-hemmed, p high electron mobility transistor, and that would be a pseudomorphic hem. Sometimes you would see m hem, that would be a metamorphic hem. And so on, okay, so, and then so on, right? Which one is which? So yeah, sorry. Metamorphic is when you have a lot of defects, but they're confined here. Pseudomorphic is when there are no defects at all. I mean, you are below a critical thickness. So that's typically the name used. Okay, so yeah. So, yeah. so one way to 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 avoid uh, uh, the defects is uh, tr trying to. So because we realize that dislocations kind of behave like charges. If you put two charges very close to each other, right, and and then the field away around it kind of goes away, right? I mean, it doesn't go away completely. There's a long range one over our dipole field versus a, you know, it's multi uh, uh, monopole field. But uh, uh, what you can do, the nice thing about dislocations also is is you can have a dislocation that may start this way, and another that starts this way, and you can actually they can annihilate each other. Then there will be no more left, right? Meaning there's an extra plane. Here and here, and then you can, they can annihilate each other. So you can form a loop or, or things like that, right? So you can actually do that. But then uh, that's uh, that works for metamorphic layers, uh, uh, and and it's been used actually. Uh, if you have, on the other hand, if you have dislocations that are only in the plane, then you are rather lucky. You know, if if they are only at the interface, like you know what we were trying to show earlier. Yeah, here is a here is a very good example of a metamorphic layer indium antimonide on top of gallium arsenide, and all the dislocations are edge dislocations that are at that plane. They don't propagate 
you know, that way. So the, 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 the line of the dislocation or the axis of the dislocation is going into the plane. They are not going vertically. Does that make sense? I mean, so, so they're not propagating that way. And uh, in, in a way, uh, if you're sitting out here, uh, you, you may be, you know, uh, at least intuitively, it may look like you're completely unaware that there are dislocations there. You know, it has completely relaxed here. It looks like a new antimony, right, out here. Right. And we'll see that electronically, you have to be also a little careful because, uh, yeah, the, 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 the strain is, is limited to a certain very small distance here, but the electronic interactions are long range, and we'll see that it can have Coulomb interactions over longer ranges. And so, yeah. But strain wise, it can. Right. And uh, so, another uh, example is, is uh, when you form this uh, misfit dislocation array that we talked about, uh, right? So, here's a good example. Uh, you have uh, let's say, uh, again, uh, the dislocations are confined in that uh, heterous interface. They don't propagate that vertically. In that case, you can have an array and then relax it that way and then go up. So, so uh, that's one way uh, if you can geometrically confine. Uh, the other, uh, another very interesting way to geometrically confine dislocations is not have uh, a thin film. Right? So you, you instead of that, you cut it off and form these mesas, right? That's another way. Right? You, can, you can have, uh, uh, and then uh, you can use this technique if your dislocations are going at an angle. If they're going vertically, then it doesn't help, right? Does that make sense? But the, if they're going at an angle, you can terminate them at the surface, free surface here, right? And, and, and then I think you can see that if there's a certain density of dislocations, then you can actually calculate based on the angle what should be the critical height above which you'll have no more left. Right? It's basically something th this divided by that should be that angle, right? Then above that. So, so this is actually used now uh, to grow. Uh, actually, on silicon, uh, CMOS people are thinking about replacing the N, N, N type transistor with uh, maybe a 3.5. Uh, maybe uh, the p-type transistor probably very soon with germanium. You know the channel will be germanium, but germanium is heavily lattice mismatched. We saw some numbers. You know. So what they're doing is uh, already the devices have become uh, the current silicon CMOS is a, is a FinFET. It looks something like that, right? And this perfectly suited now because they can now actually uh, go in and and then maybe etch away this part and 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 grow germanium on it. And then if you form defects, they just annihilate and this part will be free. You know, something like that. Yeah. Uh, so don't get me wrong, if you, do, if you don't have the need to do this, you don't want dislocations at all, right? But if you're forced to, right, then you can use the tricks to, to try to annihilate dislocations on surfaces. And obviously, as you go smaller and smaller, if you go to nanowires, for example, then, then the dislocations immediately terminate, and typically nanowires grow defect-free. I mean, dislocation-free, not defect-free, but they can be point dislocations and other things, and twin boundaries and others. But they become geometrically you can kind of constrain it. So, yeah. Another very useful technique that is used is, is uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, super lattices. So super lattice filters. So uh, let me just uh, point, uh, say that uh, if you have a substrate and then uh, you grow a strain layer and unstrained layer and strain layer and unstrained layer, what you f if you introduce many, many interfaces, as we saw, there is a good chance that it wants to form kinks and you know double kinks, single kinks, and all that sort of thing. It wants to bend. The dislocation can bend, and then essentially uh, with that, you you kind of uh, as the length changes here and all that, it can the the dislocations essentially can instead of going that way, it can essentially turn out and then be able to you know not thread out, thread over to this region, but kind of terminate within this layer. That's a super lattice filter, and that's used many times also. For reducing dislocation density, uh, and and uh, another very nice way is called a lateral epitaxial overgrowth or LEO, sometimes epitaxial lateral overgrowth. Right? And here, what you're doing is you have a substrate, and you're going to grow a, 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 a strain layer. But what you do is you pattern first, you know, mask it, and only grow over certain windows. Right? Only grow over certain windows. Right? And then when you grow, uh, when you grow this way, I mean, first you grow this way, uh, rather you start growing, it, material grows here, and it doesn't grow here. You can do selective growth. Actually, you can change temperature, use a mask, such that it only grows here, doesn't grow here. Okay. And then as it grows here, uh, it will have 
defects because there'll be this layer we are trying to grow will have defects that there are strain and all that, right? Uh, maybe threading dislocations that go up. But once the growth reaches here, the crystal also starts growing this way and this way, or maybe even this way and this way. Right? Right? So, but the dislocations remain limited to this window; they don't go grow here. Right? And what you'll see is well, that some of them might thread here, and then you can go back. And it's a little painful process, but you, people use it now. You can put another mask here, and you know, mask these, and then keep doing that. Right? So this is a, another way of filtering. And uh, this is a commercially uh, used technology today. Uh, epitaxial lateral overloads, primarily for gallium nitride. I'll show you some pictures now of, of, of what, how effective they are and all that. Okay? So, uh, so there are other ways, but I think these are some of the primary ways. Geometric confinement and uh, you know, super lattice filters and uh, masks and all that, mask growths and all that, to avoid or change the direction of dislocations and filter them and reduce their number. So, yeah. So let's uh, look at a few uh, uh, examples now, uh, and and what we'll. Uh, right. So let me use this maybe. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh. Mm, yeah. I, I, so so one of the other things I just want to mention because I saw this picture is is that remember the edge dislocation has strain fields around it, right? I mean large strain fields, and we saw the physical reason for that uh, is is very clear that that there is. In an extra plane of atoms, right, that has been introduced. So, for example, one of the very interesting discoveries here. Uh, so, I should add one more method, uh, another method for reducing dislocations. Uh, so, for example, uh, Gene Fitzgerald and uh, uh, Dieter asked and others. What they figured out is, if you have an extra plane, and you basically heat it and make the generation of point defects highly favorable, point defects. Vacancies, sorry, vacancies. Point, point defect is very general. A vacancy, highly favorable. Right? Uh, remember, you can do that, right? Uh, we had talked about how do you, with temperature, these are all exponentially dependent on temperature, right? So you, you go to a certain range, and then what happens because of the strain and other things, the point defects get pulled and sucked into, the, into this region. Right? And what happens is now you have a point defect, and they will actually arrange into a line, right? And you can see what you're doing. You have an extra plane of atoms here in this plane, right? And when you put a vacancy, that point moves over there, and you're gradually pushing the dislocation out right? by, by forming vacancies. Right? You're annihilating the dislocation one line and then another. And another. Does that make sense? You can actually do that by, 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 you can annihilate dislocations at least one step at a time, right? So, and, and because of the strain fields and the energetics, the, the vacancies want to you know, depending upon the crystal and, and the particular material, they want to accumulate at the center of the dislocation. That's the lowest energy point for them. And then when, the, when you put each... So, for example, you know, uh, so remember there's, let's say, a silicon atom here, 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 and then you put a vacancy here, then the dislocation was moved up, um, the line moved up, right? and, and so on. And then you can push it out of the crystal. So that's very... Yeah, so the vacancies will move all the way to a certain surface, and then you typically etch, etch away the top layers. You know? I mean, obviously, you have an extra layer of atoms, right? And, and then, uh, but the dislocation center can move all the way, and then once you reach the surface, it can rearrange, you know, maybe form a step and gone, right? I mean, there's, there's bulk, is, there's no more dislocations. So you can do that, actually, yeah. Uh, and uh, you're lucky if that happens, because many times it doesn't, and dislocations actually get stuck. And the reason they get stuck is also very interesting, and it's used in, in a lot of uh, applications. And, and uh, uh, so, so around a dislocation, again, we saw that there is a strain field that looks like sine theta over R. And uh, if you plot it, uh, uh, again, uh, x, y, z, uh, let's say this is the strain field. Uh, it says, uh, epsilon should be the strain. I've been using U for so long, but yeah, okay. Uh, and and uh, uh, essentially, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, going... You know, it's kind of blowing up at the center, but uh, some regions have uh, compressive strain, right? Let's say uh, compressive strain, and some regions have tensile strain. And now, uh, what what you can do is, if you have some point defects, you know, imp impurities in a crystal. Uh, uh, let me just sketch this this way. You know, so I have a strain field that might look. Uh, it'll, it'll kind of blow up here, and then it'll come back up here. Something like that, along this axis, let's say, right? 
Does it make sense? I mean, this negative here and positive there, this train. Yeah. And, then, and then, you know, it's going as sine theta, so it goes through a little, you know, twirl around. But, uh, uh, so, so if I have point of view, let's say I have some unintentional impurities in my silicon crystal or gallimosinite crystal, and that crystal impurity, you know, phosphorus, let's say. You know, phosphorus is intentional to open, but let's say I got in somehow, I didn't want it there, right? You got it, right? An unintentional impurity. Now, uh, so phosphorus is a bigger atom than silicon. I mean, it's a, slightly bigger, and, and, and so if it wants to fit into the silicon crystal, uh, it will kind of just intuitively, it will try to push things out, right? And it will cause, uh, around it region, it will cause a compressive strain. It will push our atoms out, right? So that means that, on the other hand, if I put, uh, if I already have a tensile, uh, if, if, if I have a tensile stretched out silicon region with negative strain, phosphorus can move there and lower its energy. Does that make sense? Right. So essentially what happens is atoms that are bigger will get pushed, pulled in into, into the dis closer to the dislocation rather than very far because there's a low energy state there, you heat it and it kind of move there and go stuck there at the dislocation. Similarly, the other impurities that are smaller than the normal lattice atoms will get stuck on the other side. Does that make sense? I mean, so, so you can take a crystal and you, you have intentionally introduced dislocations and then this is, uh, for example, let's say you introduce a loop of dislocation that goes in like that. Let's say, this is a whole crystal and you're intentional. And now you have all these impurities, some are bigger, some are smaller, and you don't want them. So you take this and you heat it. Heat it and that makes these atoms mobile. And they have low energy state, for example, this one go there, that one will go here. You know, go there, then go here, and so on. Right? So it, you are removing impurities using these locations now, right? And then after this all is said and done, uh, you have removed this and you etch this part away. You polish it, remove that. Clean. And this is called dislocation gettering. Uh, and then you know you can use one defect to remove the other and then you remove the whole whole thing you know, this, and your net other rest, rest of the crystal becomes purer. Does that make sense? This is another trick to use because you have these strain fields around. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, now uh, what we'll do is uh, just uh, talk about uh, um, and there please read uh, the chapter from uh, Rocket and, and some of the stuff I posted because there's quite a bit more details and uh, other as I keep, every time I say I remember one more thing, so I, I just remembered one more thing. Okay. So, uh, okay, so what you have noticed is the energy cost of a dislocation goes as square of the Burgers vector, p squared. Right? What does that mean? If, it means that, or what is the implication? The implication is if I have, for example, a uniaxial crystal, you know, like gallium nitride, where one lattice constant is much larger than the other, it's a hexagonal crystal. Right? One lattice constant is C, the other is A, C would be like 5.1 angstrom, the other would be like 3.1 angstrom or something, 3.2 angstrom, something like that. Right? So which direction would the dislocation form? Let's say edge dislocation. Right? So it will have a lower energy of formation at a lower lattice constant. Burgers vector is about the lattice constant. Right? Does that make sense? Yes. So, so therefore, uh, uh, you know, a broken bond in this direction would be better, meaning the Burgers vector this way is better. And Burgers vector in the edge dislocation is perpendicular to the line, so the dislocation would like to be like that. Good. As an example, there are many other things. So for example, there are, uh, uh, let's say, so th this is also the reason why one dislocation wants to break into partials. There are, you know, in one direction there's one lattice constant, but if it goes at 45 degrees or 60 degrees, there will be two different lattice constants which are smaller and the square would be smaller than the, you know, one of them. So it can break into partials and all that. It just lowers its energy that way. So, uh, okay. All right, so uh, let's go over to the electronic properties now. Okay. Uh, uh, electronic properties would, uh, uh, so we'll start. Actually, I uh, just want to share some of our own research and related work here uh, because it's uh, very much connected to dislocations. And actually, the first paper I wrote myself is related to dislocations but their effect on transport. Now, how do they affect mobility? Uh, so, for example, if I have a hemp or a two-dimensional electron gas, and electrons are moving around like that, uh, and I have a dislocation that goes through the hemp, and this happens in gallium nitride, where you have uh, aluminum gallium nitride layer 
or a, you have solved that problem in your assignment where you have a barrier which could be aluminum nitride or aluminum gallium nitride and GAN and you get a 2D electron gas here, right? This is some, a problem you have solved. And now the question is, what if I had these threading dislocations that's going through? Why do you have these dislocations? Because the substrate I grew it is on silicon or on sapphire and there's a huge lattice mismatch. And so, so I have these and uh, I typically am growing it along the C direction and I just told you that one of the reasons one of the reasons why the dislocation is going to be like that right? so it's going to go through like that and then uh, uh, now they have electrons basically moving in this plane uh, <coughs> right and they will essentially the dislocation is, 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 is going perpendicular to it and it can now scatter electrons in many ways uh, uh, for example uh, the edge dislocation has an array of dangling bonds this is an array of dangling bonds, a line of dangling bonds, not an array. So, yeah, uh, going back again to the picture. Uh, so, so you know, these these atoms in this point. So, this is not bonded to anything anymore. Right? This is a dangling bond, dangling bond, right? Every unit cell, there's a dangling bond, and that dangling bond. So, there's basically we're saying there's a you know dangling bond uh, electron uh, state uh, all along the dislocation, right? and uh, that, so the dangling bonds can actually have charge in them or not. They can be charged or they can be uncharged. Again, uh, one can do the energetics of that and people have done DFTs just like we did for vacancies and interstitials, right? We did the calculation that if it's charged, you know, what are the thermodynamics of it and all that. We talked about that. Similarly, for this, you can do that. Uh, and, and if there's uh, charge in, in, in a dislocation core, this is called the core of the, or the axis of the dislocation. And if the dangling bonds actually have charge on them, then it can obviously affect things quite a bit, right? So, for example, let's forget for a moment this problem and say that I have dislocations uh, going through at a certain density of dislocations, right? And uh, uh, it has all these dangling bonds, right? And let's say uh, you can define, uh, so let's say the lattice constant is C. You know? Lattice constant is C angstrom, 5 angstrom, 3 angstrom, whatever is the lattice constant. And uh, therefore, uh, you can see that there are uh, uh, 1 over C is the density, linear density of the dangling bonds. Right? And thermodynamically, or you know, Fermi Dirac distribution and all uh, tell you that, well, you have a certain occupation function, F, of filling that state. Where is the Fermi level? I mean, it will be a certain level. Fermi. So this, here's the occupation function. Could be one, could be zero, right? So this is uh, this times electron charge Q is therefore the linear charge density of the dislocation. Right? The linear charge density. How, how many coulombs per unit meter or coulombs per centimeter or nanometer, right? Is that clear? I mean, that's a very standard intuitive picture. And so this is uh, the charge density of a dislocation. And now you can see that uh, if I had a dislocation, uh, I should draw a little better 3D picture here. So the tip of this location is here and the tip is here. Uh, <coughs> let's break this here. So uh, uh, if I have negative, so let's say my semiconductor crystal, the bulk material was doped with a doping density of ND, let's say. Right? ND, uh, electron density per unit centimeter cube. 10 to the power 17 per centimeter cube, something like that. Okay. Uh, now, uh, uh, I think if you kind of try to draw energy band diagram along this direction, what you realize right away is, is that the conduction band very far out here would be flat with a certain electron density, so the Fermi level is always constant. And as I go close to the core of the dislocation, and let's say it's charged with negative charges, electrons, it's, 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 it's like an ionized acceptor. It, it's, it's, right? It is like an ionized acceptor. So these are the states. So because it's an ionized acceptor, it looks like it's p-type doped. I'm going to do that. Right? p-type doping will pull the Fermi level closer to the valence band. But the Fermi level is fixed, so the valence band has to move closer to the Fermi level. Right? And it's going to now come down as you go across the dislocation. And it's very straightforward. I mean, you had electrons all over. If you didn't have a dislocation, there will be electrons here. But now those electrons are sucked in, they're trapped in the core states, they're stuck at those dangling bonds. They cannot move, right? Does that make sense? And then therefore, you, what it, the dislocation has done is it has taken away a bunch of electrons that were supposed to conduct. Right? 
it has taken away some electrons. Does that make sense? I mean, those electrons are stuck in this in the core of this location. They're not mobile anymore. Right? They moved out. And from here, you can straight away write down. You can see right away uh, that uh, and, and and then this this uh, just from charge neutrality. If your doping is ND, uh, you can you know you'll see that there will be a cylinder around it. It's it's a, it's a you know if a linear dislocation, this is it's going to deplete a cylinder around it. It's going to re remove electrons from a cylindrical region, right? And uh, the radius of that cylinder, you can uh, uh, basically write it down by saying that, uh, uh, look, uh, you know, uh, ND times uh, pi r square, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, so pi times radius square, the volume, uh, the area, times, let's say, a certain length, and I think the length, you know, is going to cancel out. The certain length uh, times ND is the number of dopant atoms that were inside there in that volume, right? Volume density times volume. That's the number of elect the electron density. Uh, that must be equal to uh, Q over C times F, right? So that's where all the electrons went, right? Okay. So so uh, so from here, uh, uh, sorry, times L, right? Per unit length, right? So so the L's just go away. Right? And then that's so. So you get uh, uh, this is uh, called a, you know at least classic uh, long time ago in Bell Labs. The person who uh, first uh, was looking at this is Reed. So it's, again, it doesn't really necessarily have to deserve a name, but it's called a Reed cylinder. You know, it actually does deplete around it. Uh, and uh, one of the interesting things is uh, you can see right away that there's another interesting critical phenomena here. That if your dislocation density is above a certain number. It's going to completely deplete the electrons. You go into an insulating state. There are no electrons left, and that will happen when the radii of two, uh, basically radii two times r, is is uh, uh, you know if the dislocation density becomes larger than one over two r, you are you are done. You have no more electrons left. Doesn't make sense. It depletes. So the depletion regions coincide, and this region, which was which is doped. It's supposed to be conductive. It has no more free electrons. Right? So they're all sucked out. They're stuck in the middle of the dislocation. Right. So that's a, uh, that's one effect that can happen. And this has been described in your uh, in in Rocket's book. So uh, uh, you can. Uh, sorry, where was that? Uh, all right. So it's been described in the you know it's a very standard formulation. Okay. So you should. Uh, how would you solve it? As you can see now, you ha if you dope it a little heavier, then then you can. You know, push this cylinder out and all that. So you can play that game. And I'll show you now that this has been used in in real devices, you know, where you ha you're forced to live with dislocations. But then, if you have such a thing like that, then uh, or or depending, I mean, it can be positively charged, in which case it's going to do that, right? I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be negatively charged. It's positively charged. And uh, this is a very important thing in gallium nitride-based uh, bipolar transistors, where you, this is an electron leakage path. You're kind of shooting electrons here, but this, all the electrons want to flow through here generally, so because it's a, and it, it's unintended. So, and the way to solve it is you dope it even heavier with p-type, and you kind of make it smaller barrier and all that. So, uh, okay. So, uh, so for mobilities, uh, just plain transport. Uh, if it's charged, uh, an electron is coming along. You see that you know this is a perturbation to the perfect crystal and therefore there'll be a Coulomb interaction between the line charge and the electron and it's going to scatter and it's going to be diffusive. I mean, the transport will be hurt. And the question is uh, how much of a hurt do you get? And, and so the calculation just says that if I have a dislocation density of 10 to the power 8 per centimeter square, you know, the per unit area dislocation density is 10 to the power 8. Actually, I should have a square, yeah, just to keep units right. You know, so yeah. Uh, then, then uh, my mobility after all the numbers are done is about 10,000 or so. Oh, sorry, 10 to the power 5 is 100,000. Right? And if my electron density is this much, but if I increase my dislocation density to 10 to the power 10 per centimeter square, my mobility is, you know, starting to approach about a few thousands. And this is the range of electron densities we typically are using in HEMS. So 10 to the power 10 is a pretty bad number because your room temperature mobility is typically limited by phonon scattering, which is about 2,000. And if you have one scattering mechanism into 2,000, the other is because of dislocations, you'll really be hurt, and your mobility will reduce. So, so that's uh, one of the things. So this is because of the charge at the, at the, in the axis of the dislocation. Right? 
But then we also know that there's strain around the dislocation, right? We also know that around the edge dislocation. So uh, if because of the strain, here's a picture of the strain. Here's your sine theta dependence. Uh, and uh, what strain does is when you strain a crystal, I think we also know that when I strain it, let's say I compressively strain, this end is compressively strained. If you compressively strain a crystal, semiconductor, typically his band gap goes up a little bit. It's like a smaller lattice constant by a semiconductor. So what will happen is the band gap will kind of change a little bit here, it will go up, and on the other side is going to, you know, tensile strain, it can go down, so you get a shift in the conduction band edge because of the strain right, around the dislocation. And the ratio of the band edge shift to the strain is what's called the deformation potential of a semiconductor. So basically, energy shift is equal to strain times the deformation potential. The trace is just to keep track of the geometry. So, uh, so uh, because there's a shift and therefore the, the electron sees, a, if it's riding on, along the conduction band, it sees a potential that looks like this, right? So it'll scatter again. It's a defect. It's not a flat potential. It's going to scatter. And then again, you have scattering because of that and all that stuff. Okay, so so the, it can scatter both from charge and from strain. Right? And the effect of both these is going to reduce the mobility. And then uh, basically, how much is the reduction? Here's a kind of calculation. Uh, showing that at a uh, uh, mobility of, this is for nitrides specifically, and as you change the 2D electron gas density uh, in such a structure, as you change the 2D electron gas density, why am I doing it versus 2D electron gas density is because when you make a transistor and you're switching it from on to off, right? switching a transistor on to off, when you're on, you are at a very high density somewhere here. When you're switching it off, you're going that way. You know, this is kind of at the threshold, and then when you go really off, you go many orders below. So the mobility is actually important in all over the, all over the window. It's not just at, at when it's just hard, you know, really on. So, so uh, what it's showing is, is you know, there's all these uh, scattering mechanisms and there's dislocations, and you, you have to compare. I mean, uh, what I'm trying to show here is, yes, dislocation scattering will be there. Right. But then there are many other mechanisms too. There are some that you really cannot avoid if you're operating a device at room temperature, there's phonon scattering. You cannot avoid that, right? If the phonon scattering is orders of magnitude stronger than dislocation scattering, I don't need to worry about dislocation scattering. I can live with it, right? It, it may cause some other problems, but at least it's not going to hurt my mobility, right? So, whereas if it becomes comparable, then you have to worry about it, right? And obviously, you know, there are a certain number of densities of dislocation where it will become stronger, right? as you increase the dislocation density. And what it's showing here is typically the room temperature mobility in gallium nitride transistors would be about 2,000 or so. And if you look at the charged core scattering, you know, the charged uh, axis scattering, and your dislocation density is this solid line is 5 times 10 to what, 10 per centimeter square, you are now really getting hurt by dislocation. But if you are at, you know, 5 times 10 to power 8, your, you know, mobilities are not being hurt by dislocations. They're hurt by many other mechanisms. So that's what it's showing. So, so as an example. Yeah. Another nice example of dislocation. So this is just transport, but now uh, I mentioned to you, uh, here's an example of this technique I was mentioning uh, uh, of uh, a lateral epitaxial overgrowth, LEO. I mentioned that, right? So, so essentially here, uh, this is sapphire, and you're growing gallium nitride is a huge lattice mismatch. So you immediately generate dislocation. Dislocations are threading upwards because the energy, you know, V squared. V squared is small along that direction, so it wants to go that way. It's going that way. But now, after growing a layer this thick, you take the sample out, put these silicon nitride masks, for example, and then you grow again. When you grow it selectively, it's going to grow through here, and then actually it can grow laterally. And this is called the wing region. It can grow laterally also. Fill. And you see this is an AFM of the surface. You see all the dislocations are kind of here, not much here. This is very smooth and nice. And, and so on. I mean, and then you can kind of do it again, uh, LEO. Uh, if you make a diode, a very standard diode, on this region, it will be uh, very low leakage compared to if this here. it's here. And then it, you know, just showing a dislocated is very, very leaky, whereas a diode in a normal LEO region is very you know, ideal, almost next to ideal, very low leakage. Uh, so we made uh, quite a few devices recently. In fact, this is going on right now. Uh, here's a dislocated diode. Here's a perfect single crystal diode. And you can see many orders change in the current leakage and all that in, in these diodes because of dislocation-related leakage. You know. So uh, here's an example of a transistor. As mentioning, you know, this sort of band diagram. Uh, this is a bipolar transistor. So you have 
what you're doing is shooting electrons, uh, uh, you know, emitter to collector, uh, the current goes from emitter to collector, electrons are going that way, for example, or things like that. And uh, this is the base. The base is a p-type layer, but then you have these dislocations through it, which is why the, and, and, and the dislocations in the base are doing this, bending the conduction band down. Uh, and and, and the, the, the reason for it is the dislocation here is, is positively charged. Right? Just bending it down. And this is a big problem because the transistor operates on the principle that the barrier height is this, not this little window here. And so all the current, and the current depends exponentially on the barrier height. So it just leaks through here. Right? A lot of the current just leaks through here. And then the way, one of the ways to fix it is, so if you have this sort of a band diagram, you're in big trouble because the device wants to be here, but your current is going through here. You can go in and dope it even heavier, right? meaning if you cannot avoid dislocations, you dope it a little heavier, and I think you, we were just discussing the depletion region shrinks, and, and it becomes something like that, and the barrier height also shrinks. Uh, goes up, and so your leakage is exponentially lower right? so by increasing the doping. So that's something... Uh, uh, Lee McCarthy at Santa Barbara was doing in his, in his PhD work. So that's another effect of dislocations, for example. So, yeah. And I think one of the, uh, the, the other one we have talked about in great detail, this is the visible LEDs, right? I had, I, I'd shown you this slide before, so this information, uh, that uh, the effect of dislocations is very severe in photonic devices, right? It, it really gets hit. If you're at 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 per centimeter square dislocation, your quantum efficiency of emission of a photon for every electron hole pair Injected is pretty near one percent, so there's no point trying to make a transistor. Uh, sorry, uh, LED with it, right? But uh, 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 but you can see, I mean, there's a very strong dependence, and this is a non-radiative recombination. The the electron and the hole. Uh, um, so so you can have defect states in the middle of the gap because of this location, and it will ca ca capture electrons and holes and 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 dissipate it as heat. Yeah. Lattice vibrations and, and, and then that's the non radiative recombination loss. And um, so it's pretty severe, was very severe in visible LEDs. And I think we, we kind of talked a little bit about you know, how indium gallium nitride and some quantum confinement and some phase separation, unintended phase separation in INGAN actually helped with these devices, right? To make it very robust to dislocations, right? And uh, now the things have moved over to very short wavelength to ultraviolets, deep UV, and again, you know, same problem, dislocations. Nobody knows right now a good solution to this other than just remove all the dislocations. Right? So grow it on bulk substrates, for example. Right? So, so that's what people are doing. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of effort now. So this is deep ultraviolets. This was visible. You know, I think the colors are probably kind of representative. Red is really red lasers or LEDs, and the blue is blue lasers and all that. Right? Uh, now we are talking UV, so but it's draw, drawn blue, so, so uh, otherwise it will be difficult to see. Yeah. So uh, right, so uh, 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 so yeah, you can see the problem, and and therefore there's a lot of effort now in either finding a solution like that, right, or growing it on a bulk single crystal aluminum nitride, where there you know you'll have a very low chance of dislocation. So for example, in our group, we've been really trying hard to 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 grow on single crystal aluminum nitride. It's very uh, typically, these are small substrates. Uh, uh, aluminum nitride has a band gap of roughly 6 eV, 6.1 eV. We had talked about it earlier. And now what we are trying to do is, for example, let me just show you some uh, pictures of this. Uh, uh, typically, if you look at transistors or some other LEDs, they're on a gallium nitride substrate. If you grow gallium nitride, uh, algan on it, you have a tensile strain. This thing has a smaller lattice constant, so it wants to stretch out its tensile strain. Right? But now if you go to aluminum nitride substrate and you want to grow these thin quantum wells for UV or transistors, you have a compressive strain because this thing is a you know, smaller band gap and this is a larger, uh, sorry, this is a smaller lattice constant, that's a larger lattice constant, it wants to be compressively strained, right? And then to make some transistors, we have to do other things and all that. So let me just show you some pictures of this, what happens when you try to grow it. So for example, we try to grow, uh, sorry, it's not very clear here, maybe I want to dim this light. Uh, whoops, okay, <laughs> all right, yeah. <laughs> so you see, this is a substrate with silicon carbide, perfect crystal, and then we try to nucleate aluminum nitride, and you see there's, all this stuff is dislocation. Immediately generate it and keep going along the C direction. 
the burgers vector is this way right? it just keeps going uh, and uh, there is a so the lattice mismatch between silicon carbide and ALN is actually very small uh, and very small would mean like four or five percent I forget exactly what something like that so in principle you have a certain critical thickness right? And uh, there's pretty much, there are one or two groups, one in Kyoto, in Japan, who managed to kind of get that to work, you know. Meaning if you're not careful and you just say, well, I'm going to just grow LN and be below the critical thickness and I'll have no defects, good luck. I mean, you have to be very careful. The window within which you get a core and growth is not very big, you know, the conditions and all that. Okay? But uh, uh, so, so, that's, that's one, uh, so that's one example. Uh, uh, and, and then you can grow it on aluminum nitride template. If you grow it on a substrate that is already aluminum nitride, but it has already some defects, then you don't generate any more defects. You continue, you know, those defects are threading, so they don't stop either. Right? This edge dislocation will continue growing like that. Right? And uh, so basically no additional defects are generated. Uh, now, if you grow on bulk aluminum nitride where there are no defects, then you get very clean interface. There's, there, there are no more dislocations here. You know, for example, in this picture, this is bulk single crystal, and, and uh, you know, essentially there are none of these lines here. These lines are because of dislocations in TM imaging. It's gone. And you can grow super lattices and all of them, and there are for other reasons. Uh, but then you have to also be careful when you start the growth on nucleation, because if you're not careful, you can still generate uh, additional defects, even in homoepitaxy. You're growing ALN on ALN. But then, if you're not careful with cleaning of surface, you start generating uh, defects like that as well. So, many factors play in a role here. Uh, let me just uh, say a few things. Here's a buried layer, right? Here's a gallium nitride quantum well inside aluminum nitride on top and aluminum nitride on bottom. So this is, we believe at this point, we haven't proven it yet completely, but we believe this, this is dislocation free. It's coherent. Or, sorry, let's put it this way. It's, it is coherent, it's pseudomorphic. There's no, there's no defects here. But as you grow thicker, you go from, say, this is what, 6.5 nanometer, you go to 30 nanometers, so you will relax it. And nowadays with TM imaging, you can actually go in and look at it very carefully. Uh, we see many other details. For example, the top interface is much sharper than the bottom interface is a little hazier mm -hmm. and things like that. You can explain them from growth dynamics. Uh, but uh, more interesting is if you find the lattice constant, you know, these are the atoms, right? So you can find the lattice constant here. You can find it along the X direction, that's your epsilon X, you know, you can, from there you can get your strain in the X direction, right? You can find epsilon along, uh, the lattice constant along Y, get the strain along Y, epsilon X, epsilon Y. You get all these tensor components, right, from here, directly. And you can make a plot of it. What do you expect here? We expect that the gallium nitride will have a lot of strain. In this plane, it will be, uh, t let's see, it will be a... Uh, uh, compressive strain because gallium nitride in plane lattice constant is small uh, is larger than the aluminum nitride. Out of plane by Poisson ratio will be tensile. You stretch up because you're stretching this way. It's going to stretch out. And now you can actually go in with TM and ask what is the distance. And uh, sorry for this, but basically these are epsilon XX images, epsilon YY images, and all that along X, along Y. So it's a basically look imaging the strain now. And then from the image, you can see that uh, the red part is basically where you have very high strain. Uh, sorry, X is actually the vertical direction and Y is the in-plane direction. So you can see that there's very high strain in in-plane, in compressive strain here. It's, the red part is very high numbers. And uh, you know the ALN is pretty much strain-free and the top layer is also kind of strain-free. Right? As you had shown some you know, uh, pictures from the book earlier, and then uh, this is, remains coherent, you make it thicker and very thick and you can see this has become incoherent. The strain is really not confined and you probably have a lot of dislocations formed now by that time, so, for example. Right, so. Okay, so you can track all these strains very carefully by looking at uh, things like Raman and X-ray and other combinations. You know, so, so Raman is a very nice method to see the strain in a material uh, and that is constant, so we use that. Uh, um, here's another example, uh, this is actually a little messier, so let me not, okay, maybe I'll just say, so this is a very thin layer of GAN, this is a thick layer of GAN. This has a certain strain that has more relaxed. Right? So as a result, you see the, the, what you can see that the peak for this region will be somewhere here, but the peak for that region will be somewhere there, so the strain is different. You can measure exactly how much strain is there in which, which layer and things like that. Right? And these things actually go into transistors and lasers, LEDs. For example, these particular GAN quantum well layers, are, this is a transistor made out of it, source drain, there's a gate metal, 
and these things actually seem to work reasonable you know about good good transistor on off and gain and all that speed is okay 100 some gigahertz uh, and uh, so essentially uh, what I wanted to share here was this is a study that has gone uh, uh, you know we have been working on it for uh, the last uh, I don't know five six years now on on ALN, and it continues to. I mean, it, it's a it's a sustained effort because we learn how dislocations form, how do you ma manage them, what are the thicknesses where you can grow them properly, and over the last five years, for example, the transistors have gotten better and better and faster and faster and that sort of thing. So yeah, so uh, so we're trying to develop this technology, and I, I hope you can see the there's a very big role of you know what we are talking about right now in 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 things that. Uh, uh, are, are uh, based on 3.5 semiconductor technology. Okay, so uh, what I'll do is I'll just end, end the, uh, we can end the class here, and I think it's just in time for, uh, uh, for pizza. So, yeah. Thank you. Good. <clears throat> All right. Ooh,